Hello, YouTuberverse. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Coming up, Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk, all about comets and asteroids. This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today is a Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk. And I've got with me co host Mark. Norman, Mark. Nice. The first timer. Hey, hey, big fan. Welcome. Happy to be here. And Thank you're, you. You're a local New Yorker? Local, got lost in the museum like an idiot. If you have to get lost anywhere, let it be the American Museum of Natural History. That's true. In the day. Yes. <laughs> oh, that would be terrifying. You don't want to get lost at night. No, I, sadly, I was using my night at the museum knowledge. Oh, I've seen oh, the yeah. movie. <laughs> Using your 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 coordinate system from that movie to yeah. try to avoid, uh, no, but we, you got here in one piece, which is excellent. Today's topic is comets and asteroids, and I know a little something about it, but I don't know as much as I should know about it to carry this episode alone. So we went in for backup. Nice. And there's a good friend of ours who's been a guest before, Natalie Starkey. Natalie, welcome back to Star Talk. Hi, Neil. Hi, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've got you online. You are in... Uh, Mexico? Just, uh, no, Mex <laughs> she's like on Mars, <laughs> actually. Oh, oh. No, no. So you're in the UK right now. Is that correct? Yes, yes, I am. I was over in California for about three years living over there, and now I'm back in the UK. Oh, we so got I'm getting used to the rain again and the cold, and I'm very miserable. <laughs> we got spoiled that you were so accessible to us over those three years, forgetting that, know. You, that you're basically a UK person. So... So there I it is. Am, yeah. uh, you're uh, you're officially a, a, a science communicator. That's like a title that you carry um, for the Open University just outside of London, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So um, I've been a, a scientific researcher for about a ten or eleven years, um, and then I got into writing, and I love communicating the science that I do. Um, so yeah, I'm getting into it more seriously now. So I've sort of like I've got a serious science background. I know quite a bit about comets and asteroids, so hopefully I can be of use today, I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. So we've got, uh, and I happen to have, I think, what is your latest book called Catching Stardust? Yes. Comets, Asteroids, and the Birth of the Solar System. I have it in my lap right I'm going to hold it up for the camera for those <laughs> people who are watching. Yeah. I, I had to do a bit of product placement, you know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But you got to come back one day and sign it. Um, Definitely. So we cl called questions from our fan base yes. on this topic of comets and asteroids. And so let's let's see what you got. N neither she nor I have seen these questions. All right. So let's check them out. Okay. It's kind of nerve wracking. I'm a bit I'm a bit worried. I, I hate having my knowledge tested. Yeah. It's, we'll it's, see it's, how it goes. <laughs> if you don't know, just say I have no freaking idea. Go on to the next question. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. These are pretty good. I, I read a few, and uh, I'm going to go hand pick first one. Should I give the whole name and everything? Yeah. Yeah. Name okay. and where they're from. Yeah. All right. This first one's from Kyle Ryan Toth. He's a Patreon member. Patreon. We got to serve them first. Yes. Apparently. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, would it really be possible to hollow out an asteroid and use it as a starship? Ooh. Cool. <laughs> Ooh, Natalie. How about that one? Okay. So. I'm going to say no straight off just to be really boring. But actually, one of the reasons we couldn't really do this, well, with most asteroids anyway, is that they're either just too hard or they're just not made of the right stuff. So, you know, we've got some asteroids that are made completely of metal. So, I mean, trying to hollow that out would be almost impossible. You know, we, we've talked about, you know, mining these in the past and, and we talked about them on the show quite a bit. Um, and it's incredibly difficult to do that. So I think mining a, a pure metal asteroid would be hard. And then the others that are made of you know, they could be a slightly softer. We describe some of them as a bit of a rubble pile. So they're mm. kind of just rock that's not very well consolidated, not very well pushed together. So that would basically break up as soon as you try to start excavating it in any way. So you'd have a better chance maybe living on the surface. But I think even then, you know, there's no gravity essentially. So um, they're kind of hard beasts to work with. I don't think we're going to live inside one. So they're very low gravity. They have some gravity. Right. They do. Yeah. They do have a little bit. Um, but you, basically, you would need to be tethered onto the surface of one. If maybe we went to the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, which is Ceres, it's about a thousand kilometers across. Wow. Um, so there's, it's going to have a little bit of gravity. But if you jumped too high and you, you would probably just end up floating off into space. So it's right. not going to be a great environment to try and live on or in rather. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think that the lesson there is. Just make your own damn spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but could you get a rudder on there? I mean, could you steer? You know what I mean? I feel like you wouldn't get any 
any directionality. Oh, I mean, if it's just a hollowed out yeah. orb. You, yeah, you need some kind of retro rockets affixed to the side of it so that you can maneuver. Exactly. Rather than just like a homeless shelter in, inside a, a, a shell. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they were thinking of with that question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a fun thought. All right. Let me throw out a, this guy. He's right. an idiot. Go for it. Kyle, you blew it. <laughs> no, just, uh, <laughs> nice job, Kyle. He's smoking weed. This is kids. Okay, we just obvious. lost one Patreon member no! there. Okay. <laughs> I'll cover him. All right. Um, this is from uh, Michael Halterman. Can comets have different colors? Diversity. Uh, maybe when the ingredients and in organic molecules are different, can they spread molecules for the beginning of life? Ooh. Yeah, okay. So uh, there's sort of two questions there. So the first bit was mm -hmm. about the colors of them. And yeah, for sure, when we see comets in the night sky, they, they can glow different colors. And actually green is a really common color um, in when we look at these objects um, for various reasons. Um, and when we look at a comet or an asteroid maybe in the night sky with a telescope, then they can glow green um, because of the oxygen that's in them. But actually, sometimes if you see a meteor coming through, so basically if you get a little bit of an asteroid break off, in the space and then head to the earth and you see that as a fireball in the night sky sometimes they can glow green um, and that's for a different reason so that's mm. some because we have basically um, nickel which is burning up so I mentioned that we had these metal asteroids earlier and nickel is is one of the metals that they have in them and actually when that burns up in the atmosphere that glows green so sometimes you see this kind of green streak um, with a meteor you're quite lucky if you see it I've never actually seen it um, so but I know people talk about it and so that's the nickel kind of burning up so yes they definitely have different colors what was the second part of that question i've forgotten already this is not good no no you're killing it. life the, uh, whether the the ingredients within the tail of a comet are are the right ones to possibly spawn life Yes. Yeah, okay, definitely. So this has been quite a recent research finding, actually, that we've discovered with some of the recent missions to Comet. So in particular, the European Space Agency sent the Rosetta mission to go and land on the surface of a comet back in 2014 now. Um, and they discovered that there was actually glycine, which is an amino acid um, within the comet. So we know there's basically these complex carbon molecules within them. And so there's every chance that, you know, they have the right ingredients for life. And this is why we sort of say, well, you know, in the past, um, we think Earth was bombarded by comets and asteroids from space. And so it's a plausible way that we could have brought life and water to Earth, because we know that these objects contain a lot of these ingredients. And we know that asteroids contain hundreds of amino acids. So, so these objects in space, they're very old, they're very what we call primitive, they're some of the most the earliest things that formed in the solar system, but they contain all the ingredients that you need to basically build a planet and, and build life on that planet so that this is why i find them such fascinating objects because they just they have everything we need and that would mean that life based on what you just said life could be vastly more common in the universe than people might have previously suspected yeah, so it, the problem is there's a bit of a leap from going from just having the amino acids and the basic, you know, carbon com compounds and the, the molecules to then getting life. Okay, so that's a massive leap because the problem is we might have all these ingredients in space everywhere. In fact, they might be in every solar system we care to look at. But the problem is it doesn't mean that we've got life because we need some very special conditions to let those ingredients become life. Well, it isn't just a simple step. So we think they're special conditions. Maybe they're common. Well, this is very true. We we have only so far observed life once, and that is on Earth. But it doesn't mean that in the hundreds of billions of galaxies that are out there on all the stars that there isn't life somewhere else. We just haven't seen it yet. Now, obviously, we don't actually know there's not other life in our own solar system. We just haven't seen it. But we, we're pretty sure it doesn't exist on the terrestrial planets, the ones that are near to, you know, these are the rocky ones near to the sun, like Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Maybe they had life in the past. We haven't discovered that yet. Um, but the, there is a chance that there is life on some of these weird moons like Europa and Enceladus and things. So we're not sure yet, but there's there's a chance it could be because they've got a lot of the right ingredients for life. They've got liquid water. They've got um, an, an they're basically their energetic um, bodies. They've got they've got heat that they're losing. So they have all the energy that they could create life and and help it you know get along and move along. So we just haven't found it there yet. We need to go and look. We need some missions to go and and, and look at these places in more detail. But they're challenging environments to send spacecraft to. So that's one of our problems at the moment. So as Frankenstein's knew, mm -hmm. Dr. Frankenstein, you can't just have the raw ingredients, you need energy. Right. 
and he had like that lightning bolt going through oh, the electrodes right. on the on the neck. Yes. See, that's all <laughs> it takes. Point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Wow. Well, that was well done. Yo, thank you, Natalie. Also, nickel. I didn't know about. That's oh, you didn't know about nickel. No, nickel. Oh, you know, please. You know, you know who knows about nickel? No. Uh, the Gucci brothers for the uh, fireworks. Ah. There's all these metals that get burned in fireworks that give you all the beautiful colors. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Nickel, nickel, copper. Um, what else do they have in there? Magnesium, I think, Natalie? Yeah. Mm, yeah, my, I think that's a good. Yeah, so it. basically it's a bit like doing that flame test. You might have done that in chemistry labs at school. Um, basically, it's the same principles. Each element burns with a different color. And I, I remember doing this when I was 16 and you kind of burn the flames and you had to register what you'd seen with the colors. And sometimes it wasn't very obvious because you didn't do it very well. But basically, this is the principles, yeah, of fireworks and everything. And, and what we see burning up from meteors, we could tell a lot about what that asteroid was made of if we can see it glowing so uh-huh. yeah it's fascinating all right this is all news to me <laughs> uh here's another one from ashley vgt this is off instagram mm-hmm. uh, i've read that water did not originate on earth but instead was introduced by asteroids but wouldn't the water evaporate away upon entering the atmosphere Ooh, burn up burn up We're coming in so what, yeah. what's up I with mean, that, Natalie? So the whole water on Earth thing is is definitely a big open debate still. Mm. Um, scientists currently really don't have a good consensus on where our water came from. So there's the problem is that if Earth started with all its water from the beginning, so our planet is about 4.5 billion years old, it was born out of this cloud of gas and dust really close to the sun. Um, And we think that that early cloud contained water because if we go into interstellar space where all our solar systems are made from, um, sure enough, there is water out there as ice, of course, because it's very cold. Um, Now that gets kind of swept up into the forming star and and then all the planets are born out of the cloud of gas and dust that is around that star. So, So there's water ice there that could then be contained within the planets that we form. But the problem is the very first few million slash billion years of um, of a planet's uh, infancy. It's incredibly hot. So it's basically just like a volcanic world. It, it really wouldn't be able to support a lot of water unless the water was sequestered away very deep within the planet, maybe, and, and it didn't evaporate at the surface. So we're not sure whether we could have, from the beginning, had our water or whether sure enough, it would have all boiled off during that process. And then we needed to bring it in later on. And we know we were bombarded by comets and asteroids about 4 billion years ago. We just have to look at the surface of the moon for that, actually, because you see that that beautiful cratered surface of the moon. And actually, we were hit by as many things as the moon was hit by. But we have this thing called plate tectonics, where our surface gets continually changed and updated and resurfaced. So we've lost all that evidence of all those craters, whereas the moons preserve them for us. So we know that we were hit in the past. And sure enough, those comets and asteroids contained water. Some of them did anyway, not all of them. And and they could, if they didn't, if they were large enough and they didn't evaporate as, and explode completely on re-entry through the atmosphere. Um, and remember, our atmosphere was quite different back in the day. In fact, we might have had much, much of a thinner atmosphere that didn't slow them down as much. Then potentially they could have brought a lot of water with them. But for us, trying to figure out um, where the water came from is very, very tricky because we need to find out you know, what the water looks like. And, and it's all mixed up now. We've got a mixture of all these different types of water. So if we want to measure it now, it's very complicated to try and figure out exactly where it came from. And, and all the comets are different, all the asteroids are different. So it's we need to just go out there and measure more of these objects to then try and kind of piece this story together. But it's, it's important because we want to understand why water's here. Why are we the only planet in our solar system with liquid water at the surface? It's a question that we really want to answer to understand where life came from as well. So that was a yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite ah, subjects. Okay. <laughs> that was clear. This is from Donnie Huss, 1130 from Instagram. Mm-hmm. How much material do asteroids contain and how much are they worth? It's like a comedian. Ooh. Now let's sharpen that and say, of the metallic asteroids that have like metals we care about, uh, can you es- estimate the value of them? And th- what does the value mean if they're out there versus if we brought them back to earth and now they're just on earth like value yeah. is just ha- value is a is a flexible thing in this right 
Exactly. It's sort of like the diamond issue. Like there's plenty of diamonds on earth. We can mine plenty of them and actually a lot of them have been mined. But then the diamond market is controlled because if we released all those diamonds onto the market in one go, we'd flood the market and the price would drop. So, you know, the big diamond companies don't want that to happen. So they control that market. So it's sort of the same thing with these asteroids. Um, one asteroid, okay, so there's a mission, a NASA mission actually going to an asteroid called 16 Psyche, um, and it's made purely of metal. We don't understand a lot about this asteroid, but it's quite large. And actually, um, the team that are planning to go to this asteroid have estimated that it's worth 10,000 quadrillion dollars. So, and that's just the iron within that. So basically, if they were to mine that whole asteroid, which would be impossible because it's too large at the moment, we, do, we have no way of doing this at the moment. But if we were to be able to figure that out, and we brought all of that metal back to Earth, then sure enough, we're going to flood the market. And it wouldn't just kill the metal market, it would kill the entire economy, because we wouldn't know what to do with all this. So, so they're worth a lot. But one of the issues is, we don't really know how to currently mine them. We don't know how we would extract that metal. And we don't necessarily want to bring it back to the planet, to be quite honest. We would like to bring some back. But actually, one of the reasons we want to mine in space is to be able to further explore space itself. So we could use these materials to actually, you know, make things. So we might have a base on the moon where we actually manufactured materials to and spacecraft or whatever we needed and tools to actually go and explore further into space. So there's a lot of economical questions around mining asteroids. Um, it's not just the science of how we do it. Um, it's then looking at, you know, how it works and what we're going to do with the materials that we get. Mm-hmm. Cool. Rebuttal? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's funny to just assign a value to something which, if you obtained it, would not have that value. Yes. Right. Exactly, yeah. So it means it's, nothing, really. It's, but, a, it's a, weird, yeah. a weird economic fact right, right. of this. So I never would have thought you'd get money out of an asteroid. Yeah, well, plus <laughs> iron is not uncommon on Earth, right? So um, I'm thinking, Natalie, that if you are going to bring a metal from an asteroid to Earth, you bring a rare metal mm -hmm. that we can use in ways that we can't do now. We can't. If you bring all that iron, are you, is there something else you're going to do with iron that we're not already doing with iron? Mm -hmm. No, so that's the thing. And, and the thing about these asteroids is, okay, they contain a lot of iron, but um, they contain maybe less than a percent of precious metals, so things like platinum and gold and these, these metals that we use in technologies a lot in the modern day. Um, now, the thing is, they contain very low percentage of these, but that is still a lot more of these precious metals than we mine in any one year on our own planet. Because yeah. the thing is about the precious metals on Earth is that they're distributed throughout the crust of the Earth and they're not very well concentrated. So to mine them, it takes a lot of effort. We have to dig up a lot of land in order to get those metals. Strip Whereas mine, if we just right. went to an asteroid, mm -hmm. they're a lot easier to obtain. Um, they're sort of concentrated in, in these objects. So these are the metals that are really important because at the moment we don't have a continued infinite supply. So the kinds of industrial technologies we're looking and you know, the advanced technologies we want to develop are sort of held back a bit by the fact we don't have this infinite supply of some of these precious metals. So if we knew that we could get a lot of them in space and bring them back, then it, it does open up, you know, the engineering world to, to new ideas because they would have enough supply to be able to do whatever they wanted. I can't, you know, off my head, think of something that they could do with them, but I'm sure some engineers would have some great ideas of what they could do with an infinite amount of platinum, for example. Yeah, yeah, I um, think that's, so that's the key it, point yeah, there. It's a lot of implications of it. That, I think that's the key point because it's not that you're just going to sell the metal and someone is going to then make jewelry out of it or something. There's industry that uses metal. Yes. And yeah. so it enables, in, no matter the price, it enables certain industries that wouldn't otherwise be enabled. Right. So yeah. you, we, what, perhaps we shouldn't think of it just as the metal as a pure thing, but the metal as an, as an enabler of other ideas that engineers would pull out of the box. We got to take a break. Mark, you're still here. Oh, yeah. Dr. Natalie Starkey, still there. Yeah. Out there, uh, outside of London. Uh, thanks for piping in. We are talking about asteroids and comets on this Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk. We'll see you in a moment. Speaking of space rocks, did you know that Japan has recently created the first spacecraft to take subsurface samples of an asteroid? Curiosity Stream's breakthrough videos on Hayabusa 2 are incredibly fascinating. They'll take you through the launch and everything it took to make it happen. I couldn't believe that they set off a freaking explosion to make a hole in the asteroid. Wait, where have I seen that before? 
Does anybody have Bruce Willis's number? I think he's being ripped off. The suspense of the probe landing was killing me. While the mission is still ongoing, you can learn more about it by watching Breakthrough on Curiosity Stream. Subscribe now. It's just $2.99 per month. And for Star Talk fans, the first 31 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash StarTalk and use the promo code StarTalk. You'll get unlimited access to the world's top documents documentaries and nonfiction series with curiosity stream sign up now star talk we're back cosmic queries edition mark norman oh yeah first timer oh yeah i love it here we're watching you first yes. timer <laughs> dr natalie starkey you still there Hi. with us expert on comets and asteroids and that's our topic for the day yeah I'm... i know a little bit and she knows a lot oh so yeah that's why we brought her on for this for this episode oh, yeah. so mark my pet subject <laughs> so, uh you've got Good questions on this. I got a million. Let Brain. me just. Well, we talked about the nickel and the iron. If if you got a question too, you can do it. Too. Okay. I just wonder if he's feeling it. He's if, feeling it. If asteroids contain diamonds, and we mined them, and we got the diamonds, and diamond prices went way down on Earth, would women still want them? Ooh. That's a, yeah. I mean, the thing is, they do contain diamonds. Um, oh, but they're actually, fascinating. even more special than the diamonds we have on Earth. So they're actually sort of like interstellar diamonds. They're older oh, than even better than our solar system. So they, but they're tiny. This is the problem. So ah, you know, size kind of queen. Hard to find. So you probably wouldn't. You'd need a microscope to actually see it on your ring finger. Ah. Um, some, but you know, you could tell everyone how special it was. And um, yeah, yeah, you can't um, see it, but, but it's yeah. interstellar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Here we are. I've read, this is from, uh, oh, I did that one already. This is from uh, Kimberly.io on Instagram. Underscore Kimberly.io. How often does an asteroid come across our solar system? We actually had, um, well, we don't really know if it's an asteroid or a comet, but there was an object recently called a muamua, um, which mm. is a Hawaiian word for basically kind of like foreign traveler or something. Um, and and it's this object that appeared and it was traveling very fast through our solar system. And some astronomers in uh, in Hawaii saw it and found it first. And that's why it got a Hawaiian name. Um and it was traveling so fast that they figured out it, it couldn't have come, it couldn't have originated within our solar system. So they actually decided that it must have come from another star system somewhere. They have no idea where exactly, they're still trying to figure that out. Um, but basically, it didn't, it was going so fast, it didn't get captured, you know, w to our sun. So it just kind of scooted by. Um, so it didn't enter into orbit into our solar system. Um, and this object has probably been traveling for, you know, potentially billions of years across interstellar space. Um, we don't know if we're the only solar system it's traveled through, but it's going on this massive long journey. Now, of course, this object could have actually collided with the planet and we wouldn't have seen it coming because it was going so quickly and it was relatively small. It was very dark. Um, so really, really hard to spot. But the thing we realize now is that we've spotted it because our technology has got so much better at trying to spot things in the night sky. It's actually probably happened before. Probably we've had these visitors from other parts of you know the galaxy many times before, but we've just not seen them. And sure enough, our own comets and asteroids could be out there visiting other star systems. Um, it's just something that happens during the process of forming a star and, and the planets around it that it's a little bit chaotic. And so comets and asteroids are essentially the bits and pieces left over that didn't become a planet and sometimes because they're small they can get ejected out of the solar system or they get thrown into the sun and they end in a fiery death but some of them get thrown out and and they just you know end up leaving the sun's gravity and and they go off into space and then there's nothing stopping them they're going to keep going so so yeah it's really cool that we've got these objects if we can start to identify more of them in the future um and actually look for them then we might be able to launch a mission to go and maybe sample one one day which would be amazing because we'll find out about the chemistry of another star system which is something that i would be really interested in um but yeah at the moment we've only seen one um, and it's kind of gone now it's exiting the solar system and it's going on its merry way into the abyss. Mm. Wow. It's merry way into the abyss. That was beautiful, <laughs> poetic. Uh, I looked up Hamuamua. I think it means scout, like a first scout, a yeah. first journey person onto a new land, in, into a new place. Wow. A scout. Yeah. 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 It's right. a nice name. Hawaiian. I like it. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Quick question. May not be answerable from Paul Pimenta on Facebook. Can we track where asteroids came from, specifically where they originated? Hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so actually, I mean, it's it's even better than that. Sometimes we get a meteorite that ends up on the on the planet. So this is just a rock from space that will usually come from an asteroid, or it can come from another planet. If we've seen that coming through the night sky and coming burning up through the atmosphere, um, then there's lots of uh, basically camera networks out there now. And um, one of them's in the deep Australian outback. Um, and they just basically have cameras set on the night sky to register these objects as they're coming in. And what they're trying to do is figure out an exact trajectory for them so that they can basically backtrack that with some amazing math and and actually figure out where that object originated um, and try and track it back to the asteroid belt itself. Um, We can sort of check our calculations in a certain way by analysing the chemistry of those rocks. So we can go and pick up that rock because basically they know where it's landed because they've got that trajectory coming in on the cameras. They can go and pick that rock, analyse it in the lab and compare it to what we know about the objects in the asteroid belt already um, from telescope studies or from having analysed them before. And actually, we've started to be able to figure out like different families of objects. So we can say, oh, it's from this type of asteroid. and, And we know that they're in this part of the asteroid belt, maybe in the middle part or the outer part of the belt so yes it's actually possible it's very complicated work but it and we're making much more progress with it in probably the last decade or so um but yeah we can definitely start to figure out and we also know if it came from another planet that's much easier to work out actually if it came from another planet than than any old particular asteroid because there's kind of billions of them out there so that's it is tricky billions of asteroids but many fewer planets yeah, there aren't there aren't too many planets. Um, but down there's to probably eight, like last I maybe two billion <laughs> asteroids of over a kilometer in the asteroid belt. So there's an awful lot of them, and there's millions more smaller ones. So mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of objects out there. But a lot cool. of them, as I said, they're in these these groups. They're in families. They're not all different. They all mm. there are groups that share similarities and where they were made and and what they contain. It's like a twenty three and Me for, for an yeah, asteroid. That, there it is. Uh huh. So you meet an <laughs> asteroid. He goes, "I'm Jewish." Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, how large? Oh, this is from Renee Douglas, Patreon. Listen up. How large does a captured asteroid need to be in order to be called a moon? And can a comet also be captured? Ooh. Hmm. Um. Yeah. So the first part. I mean. In fact, the, it depends what you class as a moon, really, because some of the asteroids themselves have moons around them. Um, we've actually started to discover, I think we've found about 200 moons around asteroids now. So these wow. are just small objects orbiting and, and basically attached to that asteroid in some way. They're, they're associated with it. Um now, the thing about the, the asteroids themselves is that even the largest asteroid we know of, which is Ceres, is only about a quarter the size of our moon. So even the biggest one, and even if you pack them all together, so you take all the asteroids in the asteroid belt and put them all together in one blob, um, they would only be about 4% of the mass of the moon. So there's a lot of them out there, but they're just not very big. So if you wanted to capture an asteroid, well, you wouldn't be capturing one of the largest ones um, because they're sort of like, you know, thousands, well, hundreds of kilometers in diameter. So they're just too large to capture. When NASA have actually done some studies looking at potentially capturing an asteroid with sort of a bag or something, it sounds kind of crazy, but that's literally what they're sort of planning or a scoop. Um, and and they're looking at something around 40 meters. Um, so it's not going to be particularly massive and it's not going to pose a problem to earth if it goes very wrong although that would still be an issue if that collided with the planet so so yeah in terms of capturing them you wouldn't capture something really massive because you i mean if it went wrong you'd be really in trouble um if that collided with earth so. wow this is all I, how have we not had more of that <laughs> why i mean I, I don't know anything and i'm on molly right now but why don't we get hit by more asteroids and, and realize it and feel it well we do get hit we, okay earth plows through uh Natalie, correct me if I'm wrong, several hundred tons of meteor dust a day wow. descend on Earth just by plowing through interplanetary space. And does it make a dent? No, most of it just just settles as dust because it, it lost all its energy coming through the atmosphere. But uh-huh. it's big enough, then it'll so, just plow yeah, right Yeah, there's like a, a right. size relationship, um, an, an inverse relationship. So the bigger the asteroid that's heading for the planet or it's going to come through the atmosphere, the the less frequently it hits. So ah. the really small pieces of dust, they're literally raining down all the time. Um, and they're called micrometeorites or basically stardust. Um, and then as you go to the larger objects, like the ones that killed off the dinosaurs, for example, then they don't hit very frequently. You know, every 
10,000, maybe 1 million years or more, Mm -hmm. um, probably more, in fact, for ones that size. We had an event in Russia back in 2013. It was called Chelyabinsk. um, And it was about a 20 meter asteroid. Um, So it's fairly large, I guess, kind of like a double decker bus. Mm. um, And that didn't actually kill anybody, but it did cause quite a lot of damage in the region. And it had this big sonic boom as it came through the atmosphere. And actually it blew windows and everything in the in Chelyabinsk town. Um, so and we didn't know that was coming because it, it was actually quite small. We didn't we didn't see it. We hadn't spotted it before it arrived. So, you know, yes, they, they happen. And obviously, if that had hit central London, I'm pretty close to central London. That's about 60 miles across, maybe if you take greater London into account. And actually, that would be quite an issue if that had landed in the center of London. So it just, it's sort of lucky that most of the planet is sort of empty. And a lot of these (laughs) asteroids tend to land in the ocean. So we don't see them and they don't cause us any harm. But yeah, they do hit all the time. Um, And just the larger ones, not as often. Well, if you're going to hit somewhere, I think Russia is the place. (laughs) You know, come on. Is that a political statement or or, or geographic statement? Well, I don't know anything (laughs) about collusion. It's it's the country with the largest landmass. Good. That's what I was saying. So it's going to get more asteroids and any more more comet collision. And a lot of it is empty. So that's that's good. But that's what they get for conquering. You conquer. You got to realize, hey, you're going to hit more asteroids. There you go. Hits. All right. Here we go. (laughs) Natalie. This is from Frank Kane, Patreon member out of Orlando, Florida. Is there a really clear distinction between comets and asteroids? I mean, comets generally have some rock in them, and asteroids have a lot of frozen gas in them, right? Where do we draw the line? Ooh, very so good. The, yeah, the other way around. So the asteroids are kind of the rocky, hard, metallic ones, mm-hmm. classically. And then the comets are sort of the icy, dusty, dusty snowballs or whatever you want to call them. Um, but yeah, this this sort of works. Um, it's, it's a pretty like old distinction that we always fall back on, um, but it's a very classical view of these objects. And actually what we're finding as we go and look at more and more of them is that we've got a lot of asteroids that can contain quite a lot of water ice and other ices like methane and things. And we have some comets that are completely dry because, for example, if they've been around the sun a lot of times um, and they've been basically having their volatile ices burn off all the time, then um, they're going to be dry and they sort of look there for like an asteroid. So there's a lot of, there's almost like a continuum, we think, potentially there's a continuum of compositions. We've got some things that definitely (laughs) look like this classical asteroid, some things that definitely like a comet that's very icy, and then a lot of material in between. Um, And at the moment, we're still trying to piece together that story of basically where these objects formed and therefore what they're then made of today. And they've also been affected by what they've gone through in that 4.6 billion year history since they formed. So yeah, basically, we have that distinction, but it doesn't always work. But we have yet to see a metallic comet. Uh, True, but they do. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. We haven't. I mean, if, if you had a purely metal uh, objects out there, then it's definitely an asteroid. In fact, you know, this 16 Psyche asteroid that they want to go and look at, they think could be the center of a planet um, that was kind of blown to pieces at some point in the past um, when a lot, it might maybe collided with another asteroid. So it had basically in the Earth, we've got this metallic core um, and that's what happens to these, the large objects in the solar system, they differentiate. So they're a big ball of magma and then the, the heavy material in that magma, the metal falls to the middle of the planet and the lighter stuff is on the outside. So if they experience an impact, all of this, what we call the crust and the mantle, which is the lighter stuff on the planet, it gets kind of blown off the surface and you get left with this solid core, which is very hard to break up. So that's what we think. That's one theory of what this asteroid could be. So we can study it to actually look at the core of a planet, which is incredibly hard to do because we can't drill to the core of a planet. So these objects are really valuable scientifically for that reason. Oh, wow, man. How come, could we film them and watch them hit each other? I feel like that'd be a great pay-per-view. It'd be cool, very cool pay-per-view. You could bet on them, like with the mob. (laughs) (laughs) You know. So we got to take a break. We'll be back for our third of three segments of Cosmic Queries, Asteroids, and Comets Edition with Dr. Natalie Starkey when we return. This episode of Star Talk is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Star Talk, we're back. Cosmic Queries, Asteroids, and Comets Edition with our friend and colleague, Natalie Starkey. Natalie, phoning in Hi. from London, outside of London. We yeah. miss you in the yeah. stateside. You were here for three years, and then you just left us. 
I know, I know. I miss California as well, but um, it's really far from home. So it's quite nice to be back in the rain. I quite enjoy it. (laughs) Said no one ever. (laughs) (laughs) She didn't leave us. She she Brexited. (laughs) Brexited. Yes, yes, yes. So, oh, so, uh, that. <laughs> oh, sorry, so, sorry. So, Mark, yo, uh, my co-host for today, first yes. timer. What do you have for us? Here we go. Let's go. Void Walker, ninety-two off Instagram. Are there any asteroids with their own natural satellites currently known? If so, how common or uncommon is this, and how does the dynamic affect tra- tracking and understanding trajectory of the asteroid? Oh, nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Could you address so a little bit of that we earlier? We definitely know that quite a lot of asteroids have moons, so natural mm-hmm. satellites around them, and it's probably other bits of material of that same asteroid, but we're not sure because we haven't studied them in detail. One of the problems is that we can't actually see them very easily because the asteroids themselves are small and therefore their moons around them are even smaller. So we found about, I think it's over 200 moons around asteroids now. So we definitely know they're there. We want to study them in more detail because it will tell us more about that object itself and how that object formed. Do you think those asteroids, do you think those moons dislodged from the asteroid itself? To become a moon? It's one option, or it could be that they captured them. Like, So some of the moons that we see around planets are either captured moons, so they're formed somewhere else in the solar system to that planet, and then basically that planet was large, and so it, its gravity attracted other objects to it. Um, our own moon, for example, didn't form in that way. It formed from the Earth itself during a massive collision about four and a half billion years ago, um, and it basically threw off a bit of our own planet, and then it coalesced into a moon, and it was then, you know, trapped with the earth um so there's different ways to form them but we need to study more of them to figure out exactly how they formed all right next question well said well said richard stenhouse from facebook hi guys love the show bit of a kiss ass (laughs) i've been listening on spotify since september 2018 whilst i'm at work and I'm as far back as season two. Can't get enough. Ooh, Jeez, nice. It's like a regular Natalie. Just, get to it. <laughs> anyway, my question is, is there a point between stars where comets or asteroids are under no influence of gravity at all? And if they somehow lost momentum, would they hang in that space till the end of time? From yeah. North Wales, UK. I love it. Love the question. That's a great question. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Because I actually only found out recently myself that some of the comets like that are in our Oort cloud, which is the, the cloud of material that's outside of our but it kind of surrounds our solar system. So everything in our solar system is on a a plane. It's on a disk, all the planets and all the comets and all the asteroids. And then we've got this Oort cloud around us, which is all these icy objects of which we actually have never really seen any of them because they're so far away. And some of them on the edge of that Oort cloud are so far away that they're almost not gravitationally bound to our own sun. um, And they're almost closer to the next star system. So So sure enough, I don't know what happens at that point. I mean, I guess maybe some really clever astrophysicists maybe figure out what is happening to those objects out there. But um, but yeah, they could easily be um, perturbed. We would say they might be pushed around by the gravity of another star system and then and then either thrown out of our solar system completely or, or pushed in so that they actually come in and visit visit the sun and the inner solar system. But but that's a great question. Yeah, they're susceptible. Plus, Mm -hmm. we the sun, the planets, and everything, the, the family, we're all orbiting the center of the galaxy uh-huh. among other stars. So even if you have a precariously positioned comet at the edge of this Oort cloud, and it doesn't have a gravitational allegiance, eventually it will, because right. we move, we're moving past other stars. Somebody's going to snatch it. Yes. and Or perturb it and have it descend back down into our star. So yeah, so yeah the things are always in motion. And yeah. if, if you're without allegiance, that wouldn't be for long. Mm-hmm. I'm so jealous. And just to be guys. clear, uh, Oort is named for a guy named Jan Oort, who is a Dutch astronomer, uh, mid-century, mid-20th oh, wow. century astronomer, who first proposed the existence of this reservoir of comets. Was he so, yeah, persecuted? It was, it was all theoretical. Like, was he, he had persecuted? no idea it was there. <laughs> yeah. And it's still not really proven as such, but because um, we've not really seen it. So it's just so far away. We'll never get there. And, you know, even if there's a spaceship out there now, like Voyager, they are not going to get there for tens of thousands of years. Um, so, yeah. Jeez. It's a tricky one. <laughs> Could we get a GoPro on one? I know. Do you think? Why not? Plus, this was mid twentieth century. You asked if he was persecuted for suggesting this. this oh, well, mid. Oh, sorry. This is relatively <laughs> modern times, right? The nineteen fifties. Right. Yeah, he. We're not persecuting. Well, not for that, at least. They were very religious then. Right. Right. You don't want to mess with that. 
All right. Uh, here we go. Brett LaRue, mm -hmm. also Patreon. If we were to mine a significant amount of a comet, would this change its orbit? And if so, how could we be sure this would not set into motion future collisions that would result in a major Earth impact? Ooh, ooh. Let me generalize that question. As we start poking around with ast landing on them, uh, mining them, what risk does that pose to taking what was previously a safe orbit and turning it into an Earth-crossing orbit that could then kill us? Yeah, it's, it's a huge risk. It is a huge risk, but this is why um, the people that are looking at doing it are probably looking at focusing on the smaller asteroids or comets if they want to look at comets, but it's generally asteroids we're talking about at the moment. And um, because then if they were to dislodge it onto an orbit that was then a hazardous one for our planet, then it hopefully would burn up in the atmosphere and not cause us any issue. But in terms of mining them, we probably wouldn't just go to them and mine them. We'd want to drag them somewhere to what we would consider a safe orbit. Um, so this might be near the moon where basically you can just kind of dump the stuff and it just sort of sits there. It's this gravitational sweet spot where um, the thing, basically, if it's a small enough object, it's not going to go anywhere. And then what you could do is have a base on the moon and go back and forth to that object and mine it gradually. So you'd basically just want to get it somewhere safe first, because sure enough, if you start mining it, you are going to, you're probably going to change its orbit in some way. And then it's hard to predict how it's going to spin and where it's going to end up in the future. Uh -huh. Good question. Wow. All right. Keep them coming. Fascinating stuff here. I wish I cared. Um, <laughs> When the asteroid's headed your way, you'll care. That's yeah, true. Yeah. That's true. We become I, the most important people in the world the day that happens. Yep. Uh, I've seen the Bruce Willis movies. Yep, yep. Exactly. It's all in the movies. Uh -huh. I know, but I'm, I'm genuinely jealous because you guys care so much that you it makes you learn. Yeah. I'm going to die alone and an idiot because I don't <laughs> care about anything. I'm dead inside. All right. Doug Bartlett on Facebook. I know we have found organic material in tardigrades on asteroids. My question is, are these tardigrades thriving, quote unquote, on these asteroids or in a state of hibernation? If alive, could it be possible that two asteroids collide or contact and crossbreed organisms? Okay, so I'm not entirely convinced we have found tardigrades on asteroids. Neil, do yeah, you? I, I'm not I, sure that's true because that's, a, that's like a true. living organism uh -huh. and we haven't found anything living. So these tardigrades are like these crazy organisms that can basically survive anything. They're insane. Um, they can ex survive extreme pressures and temperatures and they can also just go into hibernation for, I think, like millions of years and they can just basically survive anything and then come back to life again. Um, I Literally, this is the, the very edge of my knowledge about these things. This is um, very much astrobiology, which is not what I do, but they haven't been found on asteroids. But I think the theory they're talking about is panspermia, where we're basically looking at transporting biological material around the solar system um, from one object, object to another. Um, and, and that's one of the theories of how life got to Earth, in fact. It's not that well accepted in... in I don't know. I don't know if it's fair to say that, but I mean, I, I don't believe it personally. I don't think that's how life got to Earth. Um, but, you know, there is a chance that the basic building blocks for life, the, the more basic carbon molecules came, you know, from comets and asteroids and were delivered to Earth in that way. But the actual organisms themselves weren't, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Well, but you just said that the tardigrade can survive anything. So it yeah. could survive a trip through space as a stowaway it, yeah. in the nooks and crannies on a rock that got catapulted from one planet to another. So you said yeah. that earlier in this program. Wow. I, I did. I did just say that. <laughs> and now you're saying that you're not buying it. Oh, he's calling you out. Calling you out. So I think the issue is we need, you know, we like some scientific proof. So we need to do those experiments. We need to take those bugs into space. And I'm, you know, I'm sure actually on the outside of the International Space Station, they've taken organisms and they're basically seeing how they react to that radiation environment because it's not only temperature and pressures. Obviously, we don't like radiation. Our biological cells can't deal with it. We get cancer and we die very quickly. In fact, you know, all the astronauts that go into space, there are a much higher risk of radiation poisoning than you would be on the planet. So this is one of the problems that biological material has in space. So we need to do those experiments. We need to take those bugs out into deep space and see if they survive and then see if we can grow things out there as well. Um, so until we do that, I'm I'm not sure that things can survive in deep space with no sunlight um, for kind of billions of years that, we, that we'd require. But, you know, I'm, I may be totally wrong. 
<laughs> That's a good way to end every statement you make. I could be totally <laughs> wrong. I prefer the term uh, special needs grades. Oh, and tardy grades. There oh, you go. I see. Oh, I, see. But, uh, I, get, I see what you did there. Well done. Both, <laughs> both of you. These, this is quite a, a speed date. <laughs> so, so, Natalie, we're running out of time. Do you have any sort of reflections, uh, simple reflections you'd like the viewer, listener to take with them as a, as a lesson for this program? Yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, someone like me, you're probably like wondering why I'm so interested in these objects. And I think it's just because I'm inherently interested in where we came from. You know, uh -huh. we're not on this planet for very long. Most of us, 100 years if we're lucky. And, and in that time, I think, well, let's give a purpose to our life. I'd love to figure out why we're here, how we got here, and, and what we're leaving to our future descendants. Um, and if basically, we may have only got here because of comets and asteroids. And actually in the future, we may die off because of comets and asteroids. They could collide with us and, you know, devastate all of humanity. So I want to understand these objects for many reasons, because of how we got here, but also to protect us in the future. And we need to understand what these things are made of and what their orbits are and understand them in so much detail so that we can actually protect the planet. I think it's important. I think everyone should be concerned about it, but not worried. I don't think we need to be worried that tomorrow we're all going to die in an asteroid impact, although it could happen. Um, <laughs> but I think it's something we need to be concerned with for the, for the future. So not, we're not leaving a ruined planet to, you know, maybe it will be ruined in other ways, but we're not going to leave it ruined with an asteroid impact in the future. And we can hopefully do something about it and here, divert here. the asteroid before it hits. I'd like to think, uh, I'm just picking up on your point, Natalie, it is it's an intriguing and underappreciated fact that asteroids and comets may have been the bringers of life, if mm. not the ingredients of life, but perhaps even life itself. And yet they can also serve as harbingers of doom for the very life that it brought. Well said. Exactly. Beautiful. And that is a cosmic perspective. You've been listening to, possibly even watching, this episode of Star Talk, Cosmic Queries, Asteroids and Comets Edition. I want to thank Natalie Starkey, friend and colleague who went back across the pond. Uh, good luck in your, your new uh, uh, science teaching uh, exploits at the Open thank University in, in the UK. And, and it's always thank great you. to have you. And how, how will people find more of you out there? Uh, I am Starkey Stardust on Twitter and Instagram, and you can Starkey look at my website, Stardust which is my name. Love it. So. Starkey Stardust, great band from the '60s. <laughs> 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 and you are also uh, one of our Star Talk All Stars. I am, yeah. So I have other shows that you can go and listen to. I've had uh, about four now. So I've got some on water in the solar system, a nice. um, lot of asteroid stuff. I looked at the Mars Insight mission, which is actually on Mars at the moment. So there's a few things you can go and check out. Nice. Very good. And we'll put a link to those shows in the description. Excellent. Excellent. And Mark, you're, you, you get around? I get around. I'm on the road every weekend doing on the my, road again. my comedy stylings in a comedy club near you. And uh, go to marknormancomedy.com. And I love your day. tweets. Oh, thank they, you, They're sir. insightful and clever and funny. I love and yours. What more can we ask uh, for, you're, for what the world needs today? You're a big inspiration. Your traffic light tweet. Oh, you I remember that traffic light tweet? Of course. That's, that's, a, that's a joke. That's a bit. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm obsessed with jokes, and that's a great joke. Oh, you know, I tried joking, but it's, you know, it don't, they don't always land, but ah. you know where I'm coming from. Thank I you. love it. I love I appreciate it. Keep that coming. <laughs> All right. That's been Star Talk. Uh, I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And as always, I bid you to keep looking up. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this episode of Star Talk. If you enjoyed this episode about space rocks, you'll love Curiosity Stream's breakthrough series about Japan's Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. It'll bring a subsurface sample of an asteroid back to Earth by the end of next year. Well, that's if everything goes right. I watched Direct from an Asteroid in Curiosity Stream's breakthrough series, and it really broke down what it takes to get to an asteroid, blow up part of it, and grab a sample and get back to Earth. Fascinating stuff. You can watch it for just $2.99 per month. And if you go to curiositystream.com slash startalk and use code startalk, your first 31 days are free. Go there right now with over 2,400 documentary features and series to enjoy. It's a great deal.